Hello and welcome to TRADOC In Depth. I'm John Harlow with TRADOC News Service. Counterinsurgency operations are a critical component to success in persistent conflict as outlined in Army Doctrine with FM 3-0 Army Operations and its companion document FM 3-24 Counterinsurgency Operations. I'm joined today by the Army's top counterinsurgency expert, Colonel Daniel Roper. He's the director of the U.S. Army and Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He has just spent the last four months in Iraq looking at the counterinsurgency situation. We'll talk counterinsurgency next on TRADOC In-Depth. Sir, can you talk about the counterinsurgency center you run here at Fort Leavenworth? The counterinsurgency center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas was established by General Petraeus and General Mattis in 2006 as they were spearheading the effort to write the current counterinsurgency doctrine that our troops are using in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places around the world. The counterinsurgency center assists the other portions of the United States Army and the United States Marine Corps educating soldiers and Marines and in training soldiers and Marines and units for operations in a counterinsurgency environment. So in effect, we're integrators to help bring together the best aspects of the different sub-institutions within the Army and the Marine Corps. And we try to help bridge the gap between the military and the civilian partners that are working in the counterinsurgency environment. What is the difference between counterinsurgency operations and major combat operations? Counterinsurgency operations are, they differ from what we would normally characterize as conventional operations because in counterinsurgency the focus is on the population and on the people. In a standard conventional World War II-like scenario of conventional combat, it's usually one armed formation against an enemy armored formation. However, in counterinsurgency, the key terrain the, the portion that we're trying to influence in order to be successful are the attitudes of the, of the particular population groups. You just came back from Iraq observing how the operations that come under the counterinsurgency manual are working. How is it working? What I observed on two separate trips to Iraq this past summer and this past fall was that the, that the concepts and the body of knowledge in, in the field manual on counterinsurgency are being put into practice by our soldiers by our small teams and by our units. It strikes me as being a successful way forward in what is a long, hard struggle. And it gets us moving in the correct direction and it's focusing on the most relevant aspects of the fight. And in this case, the most relevant aspects are not always the bad guys with weapons. The most relevant portion of a counterinsurgency effort is the attitudes and behaviors of the general population. When they put the counterinsurgency manual to work and selected General Petraeus to lead the surge, from what you have witnessed, did you expect it to go this well? I think well is a, is a relative term. I, th I think it is clearly moving us in the positive direction. And the important thing to understand when we're talking about a counterinsurgency in general is something that we all have to accustom ourselves to. A counterinsurgency normally takes eight to 10 to 12 years in order to reach a successful conclusion. and we're nowhere near that point of time at this point in Iraq or Afghanistan. So the progress is slow, it's incremental. In some cases, it's one step forward, two steps back, regroup and move forward. But if you keep your eye on the ball, which again is the, is the population and, and their attitudes and their perceptions, they, those attitudes and perceptions do not change overnight. It, it's a long period where we have to demonstrate through our words through our actions and through the outcomes of our actions that we're going to see this through and that we, we, we will prevail in this environment. How tough is it for a soldier in the field to go from working major combat operations one minute to doing counterinsurgency the next? The, the strongest thing we have going for us right now is the agility and the adaptability of our young soldiers and Marines and the young U.S. government officials from the State Department and the United States Agency for International Development. They have got the agility to prepare themselves to do what we ask of them. The challenging part is for the institutions and the staffs to help, help them understand what's relevant 
in the particular operation that they're undertaking. The conditions change. It's an extremely complex environment, and sometimes factors beyond the immediate uh, vision and scope of the, of the troops on the ground complicate things. But again, I, I think we've got the adaptable, flexible young leaders that can make it work. We have to help frame it with the proper guidance. How challenging is it to get organizations like USAID, the State Department, and the other government agencies who play a key role in making counterinsurgency operations work? It, it's challenging, and it's, but it's, again, it's moving forward in a, a slow, deliberate, somewhat sporadic manner at times. I think it's, the, the hard part is not getting them to work together. The hard part is we haven't trained them together or educated them together, and what it occurs to me is we're seeing an all-star team on the field as opposed to a Super Bowl team. So we're putting the best we've got and putting them right where the problems are, and they're doing the very best that they possibly can. And this is, again, from all aspects of the U.S. government that are there. However, they weren't together in the preseason, so they don't know how, how to play well with each other. Therefore, you have some inefficiencies. Sometimes you have some counterproductive efforts where the left hand might not know what the right hand is doing. And then we have to do this over time. This is a long, sustained operation, and we won't solve it today or tomorrow or next week. We'll solve it over the course of about a decade. Sir, let's use a football analogy. The Patriots win because they have a deep bench. You said we basically have an all-star team working counterinsurgency right now. How do we build a bench so the all-stars don't get worn out? It's exactly the question that the institutional army and the institutional Marine Corps, and quite frankly, the entire United States government needs to ask itself is we've put our, our troops in a very challenging situation that's very dynamic and they're adjusting and making progress on the ground with the limited resources that we've been giving them. The challenge for us as an institution is to take the lessons that they're learning and bring them back to the left on the timeline to, to find ourselves in preseason so we draft the right players based on who we anticipate facing in the upcoming season. It, obviously, it's not quite that simple, but then we get the right skill sets, and then we have the agility, so if we need to go left, we can go left, and if we need to focus on the right, we can move to the right. We, right now, we're just putting them on the field and blowing the whistle and telling them to go, and we all intuitively understand that's not the best way to prepare ourselves. How much of the counterinsurgency skills are you training units getting ready to deploy? As of January, February 2008, the entry argument for these units is a population of some very skilled, very experienced soldiers and Marines, some of whom are on their third or fourth tours or deployments into one of these operations. So we're starting on average with, with a much higher level of experience than we were five years ago. But, and what we're trying to do is help them in a sequential progressive manner go from elementary school to high school, to college, to postgraduate, if that in fact applies to them in their unit for where they're going. So they, they've been exposed to, they've been experienced, and, and they have been educated in preparing themselves to operate in a counterinsurgency environment. But the important aspect about operating in counterinsurgency is it's not a set of skills that you teach an individual, it's really more a way of thinking. Our soldiers are performing many of the same skills that they would perform in major combat operations. They are still loading weapons, clearing weapons, firing weapons, they're still maneuvering, but they are doing it in context with protecting the, the relevant aspect of the population as opposed to focus specifically on finding and destroying an enemy formation. How far down the leadership chain does counterinsurgency operations need to go? The bottom line is we can always use more education, and quite frankly, our education system is what is, pre is preparing us to be as agile and flexible on this environment as we are. We, we can do more f for all of us and we're trying, we within the, the Army as an institution and the Marine Corps and the rest of the go U.S. government that's participating in this, quite frankly, we're trying to identify the skills and the aptitudes that we need to empower our leaders with because, quite frankly, when there's a young captain on the ground in a city block of Baghdad, he is the U.S. government. He is where all the elements of, the, of national power come together or don't. The, the Iraqi on the street or the Afghan in his village, they're not looking to the National Security Council of the United States government. They're looking to the uniformed 
military leader, whether he be a corporal, a captain, or a colonel, that is the U.S. government. And if we have not empowered that young leader with the, with the skills and the access to all the capabilities that we can bring to bear, then we've done him a disservice and we have not been as effective as we might have been. How do you get the counterinsurgency operations way of thinking into NCOES, officer education, and the civilian education systems? It's a, it's a challenge and it's a tension because we don't want to train young captains. They're coming in the Army to, to be company commanders and troop and battery commanders. We're not training them to be U.S. Agency for International Development leaders. We're not training them to be State Department. What we have to do is help educate them so they understand that there are other skill sets and it help educate them so they understand what questions they need to ask. In a counterinsurgency environment, you don't go in with just identifying a solution. Here's a problem and here's how I'm going to tackle it. It's asking some very probing questions from multiple perspectives to get to develop a 3D picture and understanding of the environment in which you're operating. If you don't do that, you risk fixing one problem and unintendedly causing two or three others. How are the Iraqis dealing with the change in philosophy? Have you noticed a difference? I think the Iraqis are waiting to see who plans on prevailing. So again, the key to counterinsurgency is trying to get the middle ground, not the extremists who are against the government and not the fanatics who will support the government till the ship goes down. Mm -hmm. It's the center portion of the population, which could be 70 to 80 percent. And they've been characterized in general counterinsurgency doctrine is the people in the middle, the ones sitting on the fence, are not necessarily ideologically committed to either end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. What they are committed to is a better way of life, or at least maintaining the way of life for them, their families, their children. And if they, if they are confident that one side or the other is going to increase their probability of, of, of living the life that they expect for themselves so they can send their kids to school, they can go to work, and they can maintain respect, they're going to go with the side that's going to, to see that through. So it's, it's critically important that when you find yourself in a counterinsurgency environment, that if you plan to be successful, you demonstrate that you plan on being successful. And if it's going to take you nine years or it's going to take you 11 years, as far as they're concerned, they'll be there for the rest of their lives. <laughs> so they have got a vested interest in not committing to somebody who abandons them at some point in the future and the, the hostile actors come back in and make them pay a price for it. What about the Iraqi government? Are you seeing a difference there? Iraqi government is almost, it, when we say Iraqi government, we don't understand the way that they are characterized. Looking at it from a U.S. model, we're, we kind of look at the world of govern, governance as there's a national, state, and county or local, and we, we understand how those interact with each other. In Iraq, it's not so much the government, but the governance processes and which, which body, which institution, whether it be the tribe, whether it be the city, whether it be the province or the national government, there's, there's a great disparity in the, in the rates of progress that we're seeing there. And we read about that in the paper every day where there's local tactical progress. However, it's not necessarily matched uniformly and consistently at the national level. That causes significant confusion in the lives of the, the general Iraqi public where, again, they're not really sure which horse to back. And if they pick the wrong horse, they may pay for it with their lives. Colonel Roper, thanks for joining me today on Tradoc In-Depth. With the Tradoc News Service, I'm John Harlow.